Uh, welcome everyone to our last um, webinar for this uh, for this year. We're very happy to have Federico Bandi as a presenter and Nicholas Hausch as a discussant. Um, and um, Federico, the floor is all yours. All right, thank you so much. Let me uh, show my slides. Can you see everything okay? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, All right. So this is joint work with uh, Alexei Kolokolov, uh, Davide Pierino, and Roberto uh, Reno. So let me begin with uh, a premise. Uh, it is arguably the case that uh, data availability has been uh, central uh, to the success of realized measures. Uh, by realized measures, uh, I mean uh, all estimators that have been constructed by uh, using high frequency intradaily uh, data. Uh, now, theory has largely focused on a deterministic, equally spaced uh, sampling within the period. Uh, that's uh, kind of natural. Uh, a lot has been uh, learned in that environment, but you know, as is also uh, natural uh, due to uh, empirical work, but also uh, due to um, predictions from reasonable market microstructure models of price formation, some emphasis is now being placed on a deterministic non equis based sampling and uh, in a few important cases on uh, random uh, sampling. Uh, the bullet point on my slide um, provides some uh, interesting uh, references. Uh, I should also mention early work by Itzahali and Meekland uh, in a related context, that of the parametric estimation of diffusion uh, processes. Now, uh, theoretical contributions which assume random sampling may or may not allow for forms of dependence between the durations and the price uh, process. But now uh, let me come to uh, the paper. We have uh, looked into empirical work which is based on realized measures. And you know, I should be uh, explicit about uh, this. We have looked into empirical contributions rather than just application of uh, theoretical work uh, that emphasizes uh, randomness in the duration. So we have looked at you know, full-blown empirical contributions. Uh, and what we have noticed is that it's sort of hard to move away uh, or to see work that moves away from uh, equispaced uh, sampling. Um, now, the problem with that is that given the typical grades used in the empirical literature and given the typical intensity of the trade arrivals, uh, using equispaced sampling leads to a substantial number of uh, zeros. Now, of course, that depends on, uh, uh, on the stock. It also depends on the time of the day, more zeros being concentrated around the middle of the day. But the general statement is that uh, given the typical grades and given the intensity of the trade arrivals, zeros are pervasive. And you know, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, give you a feel for that pervasiveness uh, in a subsequent uh, slide. So what does the paper uh, do? Our first objective is to study the asymptotic impact of trading action uh, or trade intermittency on realized measures. We're gonna focus on the power variation in the presence of the typical sampling scheme, the sampling scheme that is used ubiquitously in the empirical literature, meaning deterministic equispaced uh, sampling. Uh, I'm going to emphasize that deterministic equispace sampling is in effect notional uh, because of trading action and the presence of zeros, it really amounts to implicit random sampling. I'm going to express all asymptotic distributions as a function of the probability of uh, trading action. Uh, consistent with empirical work and with market microstructure theory, I am going to assume that the probability of trading action is time varying and possibly correlated with the volatility of the underlying efficient price process. 
My second objective is to uh, deal with the biases that are induced by trade in action on an equity space grid and study the asymptotic impact of trade in action on realized measures, again, just power variation in the presence of explicit random sampling. In other words, by sampling based on uh, trade executions. Uh, I'm gonna express all asymptotic distributions as a function of the probability of trading action. Uh, and I will use a combination of explicit random sampling and thresholding to separate continuous from discontinuous uh, variation. Finally, and hopefully I will have uh, time to show you some results, uh, I will use the cross-sectional pricing of higher order moments as an economic lens to evaluate the implications of uh, theory. So let me give you uh, a sense for the pervasiveness of uh, trading action and as a consequence zeros uh, on the sampling grades that are typically used in the empirical literature. Uh, I'm focusing on a five minute grid. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'm reporting is a uh, histogram based on 5,809 stocks sampled between 1998 and 2018. And so what you see is uh, substantial spread in a percentage of zeros at five minutes. Uh, the distribution is skewed, uh, high mean of course, uh, and reasonably high mean uh, as well. Uh, let me slice the data just a little bit uh, differently. This is a time series uh, plot of the cross-sectional averages across stocks. The percentage of zeros has declined uh, over time, but it has stabilized uh, since uh, 2010. It has stabilized around uh, considerable uh, values. Uh, now, this is a five minute grade. Uh, in empirical literature, we see grades that are finer uh, than five minutes. Of course, on a finer grade, the percentage of zeros would be uh, higher. Now it's relatively uh, simple uh, from a market market structure uh, standpoint to think about uh, trading action. And it's also relatively simple to think about uh, durations that are uh, correlated with the underlying um, uh, spot volatility process. And so uh, what I'm going to give you just very uh, briefly is sort of a, you know, a way to uh, conceptualize uh, both uh, um, um, findings. I'm going to think about an efficient price, uh, which is uh, private information uh, and is uh, a uh, Martingale. Um, I will also think about a midpoint, which is set by a uh, specialist, of course. Uh, the process for the midpoint is a partial adjustment uh, process. The idea is that uh, the specialist learns from uh, trades uh, where the efficient price is and the speed of learning of the specialist is dictated by a parameter uh, delta. Uh, if uh, delta is equal to zero, if there is no uh, learning, the midpoint uh, is uh, a martingale independent of the uh, efficient price. If delta is equal to one, uh, then uh, the midpoint is effectively uh, the efficient uh, price. This is a model in the spirit of Hasbrook and Ho and Amy Hood and Mendelssohn. The difference from Hasbrook and Ho is that uh, if uh, delta is equal to zero in their case, the midpoint is effectively constant. Uh, the difference from uh, Amy Hood and Mendelssohn is that uh, the model is applied to midpoints rather than to transaction prices. Uh, and that sort of gives me a segue into uh, transaction prices. So let me talk about uh, transaction prices. I'm gonna think about uh, the arrival of informed traders and uh, uh, noise traders. Informed traders arrive with the probability I, uh, noise traders arrive with the probability one minus that. Uh, and uh, of course, noise traders just toss a coin. 
And so transaction prices will be either at the bid or at the ask, uh, given the midpoint, just based on a coin toss. Um, in the case of informed traders, of course, they trade based on information. They know what the efficient price is because the efficient price is nothing but a conditional expectation of future cash flows given their information set. And they trade when the difference between the efficient price and the midpoint is larger than the cost of transacting. If that is not true, then the informed traders would just sit idle and not uh, transact. Now, when they transact, um, they would transact either at the bid or at the ask based on convenience. If it's not convenient to trade, they're not gonna trade and that's going to lead to uh, stale prices or in other words to uh, zeros. So this is a simple model uh, that incorporates many of the themes in the market microstructure uh, literature of price formation with asymmetric information, it leads to zeros, it leads to trading action, but it also leads to correlation between uh, the underlying volatility, which uh, is assumed to be time varying, of course, of the underlying efficient price process uh, and the uh, durations. The, you know, the intuition is simple, if the volatility increases, there are more opportunities for trades for the informed uh, traders. Uh, and that's gonna lead to, of course, more trades and uh, uh, shorter uh, durations. Uh, and so that negative correlation would be uh, consistent with the work of many, including uh, Engel and uh, uh, Renault and uh, uh, Werther. Um, we have uh, estimated uh, a similar model structurally uh, for a single asset or a multi-asset uh, case uh, using staleness slash idleness uh, measures as moment conditions. In our previous work, the emphasis was on learning from uh, staleness about um, illiquidity or asymmetric information or the learning or the market maker. Uh, here, the emphasis is on a much more traditional set of quantities uh, in the financial econometrics literature, namely um, power variation type uh, quantities. So this is going to be uh, the efficient price, the red stuff. Uh, the observed price is going to be the blue stuff. Uh, and so I am going to as assume that the observed price uh, X uh, uh, tilde is uh, the efficient price only when there is a trade. Uh, and there is a trade when uh, the random variable B, which is a Bernoulli random variable, turns out to be a zero. If the Bernoulli random variable B is a one, then we have uh, trading action and uh, the price at time TJ is nothing but the price at time TJ minus one. So the efficient price will always be in red. Uh, the observed price will always be in blue with a tilde as well. So let me, uh, let me come to the econometric model. Uh, the data generating process is uh, standard. Uh, I will assume that the efficient price, the red price is a, a semi martingale with uh, small and large jumps. Spot volatility is also a semi martingale with small and large uh, jumps. Uh, as, um, Indicated earlier, the observed price, the blue price with the tilde uh, is going to be the efficient price if uh, uh, the Bernoulli random variable B is a zero. If the Bernoulli random variable B is a one, then we're gonna have price um, staleness or if you want trade uh, in action. Uh, I will assume that the probability of trading action, uh, in other words, the probability that the Bernoulli random variable B is a one, is a stochastic process, of course, taking values in uh, zero one. 
Uh, that process is driven by Brian shock uh, Z, which is independent of the Brownian shock W uh, affecting the price process, but importantly, does not have to be independent uh, of the Brownian motion V, which affects the spot volatility process. And so I'm allowing for correlation between uh, the probability of trade in action and the underlying spot volatility, which will lead to uh, dependence between the durations and spot uh, volatility. I'm gonna focus on uh, uh, power variation as my uh, family uh, of uh, estimators. Uh, I will, um, spend a little bit of time talking about the even case uh, and the odd uh, case. There are differences between one and the other uh, that will be uh, you know, sort of relevant, particularly when we uh, go to empirical uh, applications. I will also distinguish the continuous case from the discontinuous uh, case as they apply to the red process, the efficient price process. So let me start with a continuous case, and this is the main uh, theorem uh, in the paper, at least from a, uh, from a logical uh, standpoint. One can show that uh, power variation is inconsistent for uh, the uh, integral of powers of uh, spot uh, volatility. Uh, we have a stable convergence uh, to three objects, a drift-like uh, object, uh, a local martingale uh, driven by the Brownian motion that drives the price process, and uh, uh, a local martingale driven by uh, a Brownian motion that is independent of the Brownian motion driving uh, the price uh, process. Uh, in red, uh, what you have is uh, a special function, which is generally called the polylogarithm or jean uh function. Uh, that's a function of the probability of trade uh, in action. Uh, and so uh, that's something uh, that is specific to our framework and arises because of the presence of uh, inaction. Let me be a little bit more uh, specific. So let me specialize the result to some uh, subcases. Uh, I will consider the case R equal two, uh, which is realized variance. R equal three is power variation of order three. And that's of course proportional to realized uh, skewness. Uh, R equal four is power variation of order four. And that's gonna be proportional to uh, realized uh, kurtosis. All quantities, of course, uh, are central to financial applications. And again, hopefully, I'm going to have some time to show you one uh, towards the end of this uh, talk. I will make a simplifying uh, assumption just to uh, be completely transparent about the uh, nature of the asymptotic results. I will assume that uh, the probability of inaction is now constant uh, over a day, but of course, changing from day uh, to day. And I will denote that probability of trading action as P0. So uh, let me start with the case R equal two, which is the realized variance uh, case. Trading action does not induce biases uh, in the integrated variance estimates. However, uh, it does inflate the asymptotic uh, variance. And uh, uh, that's, you know, very easy to see uh, because, you know, because of course P0 is a positive uh, quantity between zero and uh, uh, one. Um, here is the case R equal three. So this is, you know, the quote unquote skewness uh, case. Uh, again, trading action does not induce biases in the skewness estimates, but it does uh, inflate uh, the asymptotic uh, variance. 
Now, the distribution depends on three terms, as I discussed before, in general. Um, those uh, three terms are not uh, the product of trading action. Those three terms arise because we're considering uh, power, uh, certain, you know, certain power, in this case, power three. Uh, and so the result, in effect, goes back to the work of Kinnebrock and Kinnebrock and Podolsky and so on and so forth. Um, what is specific to our framework is, again, the presence of um, price uh, in action through P0 and the presence of, you know, the poly logarithm uh, function that does include uh, P0. Let me now turn to the case R equal four, which is the quote unquote cartosis uh, case. Now, um, Trading action induces uh, biases, which may be substantial. And I'm gonna uh, show you some numbers uh, in a second. Again, uh, the asymptotic uh, distribution is going to have an inflated uh, variance. So in terms of big picture, um, odd powers do not uh, determine uh, biases, or I should say trading action in the presence of odd powers does not determine biases. Uh, trading action in the presence of even powers does in, uh, induce biases. The only exception is realized variance. In all cases, the asymptotic variance is uh, inflated. So let me give you a feel for the uh, inflation um, of the bias uh, uh, when considering uh, even powers. And I'm just gonna focus on the case R uh, equal four. So this is again, the quote unquote cartosis case uh, for a level of price in action equal to 0 0.5, um, the, uh, the measure would effectively be doubled. So uh, we would have uh, a, uh, you know, a considerable uh, bias. Uh, so rather than estimating true uh, fourth uh, power, we would estimate something that is twice as big. Let me now turn to the uh, discontinuous uh, case. Uh, appropriately standardized power variation uh, would converge stably to a uh, distribution which is reasonably standard in the literature from the work of uh, Jacquard and Prater. The difference here is uh, the presence of a random variable, discrete random variable LP. Uh, in the asymptotic distribution, which again captures uh, trade uh, in action. I'm reporting results for R larger than three. Uh, the case R equal two and R equal three are also in the paper in theorem five and four. So let me now go to uh, realized skewness and uh, realized uh, kurtosis. Um, there fairly easy to uh, define in continuous time as a function of power variation of order three and of order four. We could also define them in the discontinuous case by standardizing by N uh, appropriately. Now, the problem with realized skewness and realized kurtosis uh, is that uh, their asymptotic properties depend on uh, whether we are on continuous or discontinuous trajectories, whether uh, we are in the presence of not of trading action, and whether we're standardized them properly or uh, not. This is a table that is contained in the paper to sort of emphasize the fact that distinguishing between uh, continuous and discontinuous variation when using uh, higher order moments that uh, is not uh, obvious. Uh, and of course, trading action does not uh, help. Um, so the suggestion in the paper is to uh, first deal with trading action and then uh, uh, separate uh, in a 
uh, in a way that is uh, reasonable and you know well accepted in the literature continues from this continuous variation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest a combination of bias correcting and uh, uh, thresholding. So I'm going to turn uh, in particular from uh, uh, notional equispace sampling, or if you want, implicit random sampling due to trading action to explicit random sampling. So now I'm going to explicitly sample randomly on uh, the original uh, partition. And in particular, I'm going to remove all of the points for which the Bernoulli random variable is equal to one. Uh, I can phrase it differently and say that I will just sample based on the trade uh, executions. If I do that, uh, then the biases that are present asymptotically with even powers are going to uh, disappear. And so explicit random sampling allows me to uh, compute uh, power variation measures that are you know, asymptotically uh, unbiased or consistent. Now, of course, by construction, uh, my uh, observed returns are going to be the same as the uh, efficient uh, returns. So on continuous trajectory, I could define bias corrected power variation. The only difference from the previous notion of power variation is that the standardization uh, inside the function and outside of the function is random. And of course, the number of observation is explicitly random. It was implicitly random before because of zeros. Now it's explicitly random because I'm sampling on a random grid. Now on uh, uh, this continuous uh, trajectory, uh, I could of course apply threshold into the same uh, object and uh, uh, eliminate uh, all of the returns that are above uh, a suitable uh, threshold. So a combination, in other words, uh, of bias correcting and thresholding will allow me to uh, compute uh, continuous variation of effectively all uh, orders. Now, the same idea could be applied to um, discontinuous uh, variation. And so again, I am going to sample on uh, uh, an explicitly random uh, grid. Uh, jump variation is just going to be uh, power variation standardized uh, appropriately. Now, for the purpose of finite sample improvement, I could also apply uh, truncation. I could select uh, returns that in absolute value are larger than a threshold so as to identify the right uh, variation, meaning jump variation. Uh, and again, I could do the same for positive and negative jump variation. In the first case, I would be selecting returns that are larger than a uh, positive threshold. Uh, in the second case, I would select returns that are smaller than a negative uh, threshold. So, um, before I turn to uh, some uh, empirical uh, work, let me give you uh, a feel for uh, uh, the contamination that uh, inaction may um, induce in the data uh, when uh, uh, considering skewness and kurtosis type uh, measures. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare uh, raw skewness and raw kurtosis to measures of skewness and kurtosis that are uh, bias corrected. Uh, and I'm gonna do that for various levels of trading action, or if you want, for various uh, percentages of uh, zeros at five minutes in, uh, in the data. And so what you observe is that uh, consistent with theory, uh, trading action inflates the variance of uh, the skewness estimates. And so uh, if we correct for it, uh, in other words, if we sample uh, randomly on, uh, on a grade based on trade executions, 
the result is more precise uh, skewness uh, estimates. Kurtosis depends on a fourth moment. Uh, and in that case, as we discussed, there are asymptotic biases, but also uh, a loss in uh, uh, inefficiency. And so uh, again, uh, correcting for trading action is going to lead to more precise and less uh, biased uh, kurtosis uh, estimates. Now, there's an interesting result in the literature that says that uh, realized kurtosis is sort of correlated with uh, uh, well-known illiquidity uh, measures. Um, now that can easily be uh, justified based on the results that I provided. Uh, if we think about the bias that trading action is inducing in uh, the uh, kurtosis uh, estimates and more directly in estimates of, uh, of the fourth. Uh, power variation. So let me uh, let me come to some uh, empirical uh, work, and then uh, uh, and then I'll be uh, I'll be done. I, I think I have about nine minutes uh, to go. So um, so I'm going to show you um, some uh, uh, results that were derived uh, in uh, uh, in an influential paper by Amaya et al. In 2015, the paper was published in the Journal of Financial uh, Econ Economics. Um, this is a paper that focuses on uh, uh, the pricing of uh, a number of idiosyncratic uh, quantities having to do with the dynamics of the underlying efficient price uh, process. So let me be, uh, let me be specific. Uh, the regressant is weekly returns on the J stock over uh, the week TT plus one. RV is weekly uh, realized uh, volatility and it's obtained by averaging uh, daily estimates over uh, the previous five uh, days. RS and RK uh, are weekly measures of uh, skewness and kurtosis, and they're obtained by averaging uh, daily measures over the previous five uh, days. Z is just uh, a set of controls. Now, the results that I'm going to show you come from um, presumably uh, Amaya et al. Uh, main uh, table. Uh, and they are uh, the following. Realized volatility uh, is not uh, really affecting um, future uh, returns, or if you want, uh, does not seem to be uh, priced uh, in the uh, in the cross section. It has a negative sign, but it's statistically insignificant. Realized skewness and realized kurtosis have a negative uh, sign and a positive sign, respectively, which are statistically significant. Uh, the typical justification in uh, uh, the literature is that uh, the sign of realized skewness should be negative because folks uh, are averse to negative skew and of course love positive skew. The typical justification for a positive sign on uh, uh, realized skewness is that there is aversion to volatility of uh, volatility. Now, as I uh, discuss, what's a little bit problematic uh, about this quantities is that the contribution of continuous variation, discontinuous variation and illiquidity is not completely uh, obvious. And let me give you just a, just a simple uh, example. The positive sign associated with kurtosis may be the result of trading action induced uh, biases. So uh, let, me, uh, let me now come from, to, uh, to a different uh, specification. This is something that uh, we report uh, in, uh, uh, in the paper and it's sort of the, uh, the final uh, specification in, uh, uh, in the paper. Again, I'm gonna be using 
the same set of stocks that I discussed earlier, uh, 4,809 NYSE listed stocks. Uh, I'm sampling every five minutes, like am I at all? Uh, the time period is 98, uh, 2018, um, for a total of about 12 million daily uh, realized uh, measures. My, regress my regressors are uh, bias corrected uh, threshold realized volatility, which in principle based on theory should not be affected by discontinuities uh, and should also not be affected by uh, trading action. Uh, I have bias corrected threshold skewness and kurtosis, which again should not be affected by uh, discontinuities and uh, trading action. I have measures of positive and negative jumps, which one more time should not be affected by uh, trading action. I'm including the percentage of zeros, the weekly average percentage of zeros, which should be inversely related to volume and uh, uh, liquidity. And I'm also including uh, Amy Hertz uh, illiquidity uh, measure. Finally, uh, I'm including the relative uh, sign jump measure of Ballerslev et al., uh, as well as past uh, weekly uh, returns. What we find is that uh, bias corrected threshold realized volatility is priced uh, negatively uh, and in a fairly uh, significant statistical uh, way. Uh, that's consistent. It's sort of reminiscent of the uh, of the work of Ang et al. Uh, you know the so-called uh, idiosyncratic uh, volatility uh, puzzle. Um, now, um, skewness, uh, just like uh, relative sign jumps. Uh, are not priced negatively and they're not uh, statistically uh, significant uh, when controlling explicitly for uh, jumps. Now, uh, that is not like saying that the intuition in previous work is uh, incorrect. Uh, there was an understanding that skewness should capture uh, discontinuities in the price process. Uh, there was also an understanding that uh, relative sign jumps should capture discontinuities in uh, the underlying efficient price process. And so the only reason why um, skewness and uh, relative uh, sign jumps are insignificant and not negative is because uh, the jumps are accounted for uh, explicitly. And in fact, when we account for the jumps explicitly, uh, the price of risk associated with the positive jumps is negative, and the price of risk associated with the negative jumps is also negative, which is again uh, consistent with the story that says uh, folks are averse to uh, negative uh, jumps, but of course, uh, enjoy uh, positive uh, jumps. Now, uh, kurtosis is not positively priced as in Maya at all. Uh, and the reason why it's not positively priced is because it's bias corrected. Uh, the bias correction alone eliminates illiquidity uh, effects. Uh, now, if we also control for the percentage of zeros, in other words, if we control for uh, price inaction or illiquidity effects directly, then uh, the price of risk associated with, uh, with kurtosis uh, becomes uh, even uh, less uh, positive, and in this case, it's uh, uh, negative, uh, not super significant, but it's negative, which again, uh, hints at something that uh, could be sort of in the spirit of the uh, idiosyncratic volatility puzzle, 
applied here to the vol of vol rather than just to uh, volatility. Now, interestingly enough, even though the number of zeros is uh, statistically uh, significant, uh, Amihut's measure is uh, in uh, this uh, specification insignificant. So uh, illiquidity uh, effects uh, seem to be uh, better captured by the number of zeros than by uh, the alternative. Uh, more traditional uh, measure. So, uh, in a uh, in a in a nutshell, we're uh, we're effectively confirming uh, the logic of the existing literature. Uh, the reason why we should see uh, attention to uh, negative skew, meaning negative skew being priced negatively, and again positive skew being priced also. Uh, negatively is because of jumps. If jumps are separated, uh, then uh, measures that are a bit more contaminated by continuous variation like uh, skewness or, uh, or relative uh, uh, jumps would uh, perform uh, a little bit uh, worse. Illiquidity effects also uh, matter, and those effects uh, may be uh, captured uh, by uh, the percentage of zeros among uh, potentially many other uh, quantities. So I have argued that uh, equispace deterministic sampling is really the norm in uh, uh, empirical work. We would be hard pressed to find uh, work out there that does not use uh, equispaced uh, sampling. And I'm talking about empirical contributions. I'm not talking about uh, applied work in theoretical papers that uh, advocate uh, random uh, uh, sampling. Yet, given uh, the size of the chosen grades and the intensity of the trades, uh, the number of zeros can be substantial. So, in effect, uh, equispace deterministic sampling is only notionally uh, deterministic. In effect, uh, it is just a form of implicit uh, random sampling. Uh, we have provided a theory of power variation estimation under implicit random sampling and explicit random sampling. And I have shown that explicit random sampling is helpful to uh, improve uh, the uh, asymptotic properties of the estimators, particularly along um, the bias uh, dimension. Um, as I said, uh, explicit random sampling is helpful, but also thresholding is helpful if interest is in the separation of continuous and discontinuous uh, variation. Finally, I have used uh, the idiosyncratic pricing of a vast cross section of stocks uh, as an economic lens to validate the implications of uh, theory. And I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Federico. It's a great talk. Um, in the interest of time, we first move to discussion. So Nikos um, has at least 15 minutes for his discussion. And uh, then we'll have a short announcement for the, um, at the end. And then we will move to the informal uh, discussion. So then we can postpone all the questions um, to that part. Nicholas, would you like to share your um, slides? Yes, but I cannot. I mean, you have to allow me. Um, I apologize. So let me give me just one second. Sorry about that. All right. Would you like to try again? Oh, here we go. Okay, do you see it? Yeah, we, we can see it. Great. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. I really enjoyed uh, reading this paper. It made me thinking a lot. I mean, you're touching on a couple of points which are really important uh, empirically. So let me, oops, that's not what I, Oops, let me see how I can. 
Okay, this looks strange. Um, okay, Let me just. No, this is, doesn't work either, right? Um, okay. Okay, doesn't matter. You see two slides. So the big picture essentially is um, you talk about deterministic equispace sampling. So can you see my mouse, by the way? Yes. Can you? Yeah, okay. So, and this implies implicit random sampling uh, due to trade intermittency. So just, just a graphical illustration is, of course, it's it's very stylized. So the red line is how the, uh, say, the efficient price moves. It's very stylized because we assume here the efficient price is only moving in equidistant intervals. But then the price does not necessarily up, or we do not up, we, we do not see a trade whenever there is a price update, and then the red line becomes a gray line. Uh, this is basically then what, what we see. So there's price staleness, um, and then we get these gray boxes here. So we see a price uh, discrepancy between the efficient price and uh, what and the transaction price. This is the formula what, what Federico has shown, which basically modeled through this Bernoulli random variable, which is a no trade uh, variable. So the implications are um, the, we see the realized moments, the even realized moments are biased, the odd moments not. So, um, that means, uh, I mean, the intuition is we see here some additional randomness due to uh, this random sampling and the odd moments are not uh, influenced because ultimately we are still working with a Brownian increment. So symmetry here is preserved, but we see that all realized moments have an inflated variance. So the additional results, which are not directly caused by trade intermittency, but of of course, trade intermittency is uh, is, is uh, making these results uh, stronger. Is the divergence of realized skewness and kurtosis in case of jumps. So what this paper now is is doing is um, it analyzes the impact of this no trade probability on the asymptotic distribution of these realized measures. And what the paper suggests is. Um, as a what Federico calls a bias correction. So it makes the bias vanishing is to remove these points for which this no trade probability is equal to one. But it's basically transaction sampling, sometimes also called tick time sampling, or here's transaction time sampling. So which is called an explicit random sampling in the paper. And this makes the bias disappearing. So the paper gives us the uh, asymptotics, consistency, asymptotic normality of these bias corrected realized moment estimators. At the end, it's a, it's a matter of scaling because the, the, the principle of the estimator is unchanged, but it depends on uh, what is the effective number of observation is. And I think this makes a huge difference here. And, and as Fe Federico has shown uh, quite impressively that it has implications for cross-sectional pricing of skewness and uh, kurtosis. So the paper gives a lot of food for thought. So first of all, we see these novel results on the effects of trade intermittency on realized power variation measures. Um, it is done in the no noise case. I mean, this has some advantages. The advantage is that we clearly see how trade intermittency or no trading, or call it staleness, um, which effect does this have on the asymptotics? Uh, on the other hand, of course, we know that in reality we have noise. So, and I will talk a bit more about this uh, later. Um, we see the, also these novel results on the effects of jumps on realized skewness and kurtosis. And what is, I think, most important here in this work is the role of zeros in empirics. I mean, I think this is an, really an important uh, point. Whenever you apply these estimators in real practice, we know very well that these trade in action matters or price staleness matters. And uh, the big question, how should we sample? So, um, there are a few buts, uh, which I think should be stressed um, a bit more. So this paper, I mean, Federico stressed this, 
So it's explicit about equidistant calendar time sampling if prices do not regularly update. Um, I, I think the key point here is um, you should be maybe a bit more explicit which setting you have in mind. I mean, it fits very well to the setting you use in your application. We really have, we really have one minute or five minute observations. We cannot go beyond that. But if we think uh, a little bit beyond that, I mean, then of course the question is this, all these results crucially depend on what we actually assume for the underlying market clock. There's no trade probability, it works fine in theory, but now if it comes to the question of how to estimate it based on real data, that's not so clear because we don't know what the underlying market clock is, what the process, the underlying unobserved process of trading opportunities actually is. So a related point is that these market microstructure models used to motivate the notion of trade intermittency, they naturally operate in discrete time. And this is also how we started. These are discrete time models and agents do make decisions in discrete time. Um, but uh, then the uh, link from these discrete time models to what you call a reduced form model in continuous time, this is not so obvious. And uh, I think this is part of the issue here. So of course the role of market microstructure noise, um, I think here it is assumed in, in, in your model that the two prices are revealed whenever there's a trade. What comes on top of it is noise. So um, that means in, in, in principle, this mispricing due to equispace sampling could be also seen as noise. Uh, but that is this noise which would be endogenous then by construction, it would be correlated with the efficient price. So I think that this is something maybe which should be uh, stressed and should be discussed a bit more. So now just the role of sampling. Uh, here's the picture again. So um, this is how the price moves in this very stylized setting. Then um, here we see that, um, yeah, this is, Basically, that is what would mean if we sample in equidistant time points and we get the staleness. And here we see what the paper suggests, namely to discard the no trade time point. So we only uh, sample here whenever we see a trade. And of course, in your setting, a trade automatically means uh, that there is a price update. Um, I mean, this is fine for the setting you have in mind and you also use in your applications. But if we, we use this in a more general context, then of course, immediately um, we, we know that realistically, equispaced or calendar time sampling imply, typically implies sparse sampling. So there could be several trades or price updates here in between. This is, so, and, and of course, in this equispace sampling, then prices are nearly always stale just by construction. I mean, it's naturally implied by calendar time sampling. And in the literature, this is called uh, the previous tick method. What people use, they just use the trade of, uh, or the, the, the price of the, tr of the most recent trade, which was discussed among others by Hansen and Lunden 2006 paper. And well, this is implied by the fact that the trading naturally occurs irregularly in time anyway. And of course, uh, on top of this, uh, we do sparse sampling. So we also miss out some uh, changes in between. The point is, however, um, prices can also move without trading. So therefore, again, I think it's important that you stress upfront which setting you have in mind because prices can move without trading. So, okay, they can move here. The question is whether we assume the price process to be discreetly or continuously. In market microstructure world, it's more discrete time. In our, in the financial economics world, it's more continuous time. And of course, trades can also happen without price change. Um, also that uh, should be said, uh, you focus a lot now on trade prices. Um, that's, I guess, due to simplicity. Um, I think it could be easily replaced by mid quote uh, prices because we know, I mean, this is some picture from some more recent papers. I was just looking for some illustrations how the uh, quote to trade ratio evolves over time. 
And we know there's much more quoting going on in the financial markets than trading. And of course, quoting a quote update also gives us a price signal. And this happens much more often than trades. Of course, the, then we could call it about, we could talk about quote intermittency in sampling. So the, the story and the problems are the same. Maybe they are not as severe as if we focus only on, on transactions. So when we now talk about this, say, trade or quote intermittency and sampling, as I said before, I mean, this calendar time sampling versus tick time sampling or transaction time sampling could be seen as a special case of tick time sampling. I mean, this is discussed in the literature. Here I quote the Hansen and Lund paper or I tell you Miklan Zhang, also in the, the early uh, literature, uh, the uh, high frequency uh, volatility literature emerged here. And um, I think it would be good if you connect your results to these results, because in these papers, so Hansen Lund, if I remember correctly, um, they also provide explicit results, uh, asymptotics now based on tick time sampling or transaction time sampling. And I mean, this, this idea of tick time sampling um, is, is used by researchers um, as a pragmatic way. Um, I think your results are very important in the sense because now people know that what they did, maybe intuitively, uh, is, is exactly the right thing. So we just uh, move away all the zeros. Um, of course, the paper assumes observability of efficient prices. This is not ju justifiable for trades. Neither it's, just, it's justifiable if we would have mid quotes, but we could argue that maybe a mid quote is a bit closer to the efficient price somewhere in between. Um, I mean, if, if, we, if you phrase it that way, I think one could e more easily live with your approach uh, because I mean, you somehow separate these effects of intermittency from the effects of noise. So I think it's maybe more natural to think about prices being inherently noisy and of course, noise could be due to various market microstructure effects, but noise could be also due to uh, a de delay uh, or basically of, of, of no trading or delayed trading, um, which makes, which would make, if we uh, argue in that way, that the noise is inherently endogenous. And then, of course, uh, things become tricky. Now, this made me thinking about how should we think about the underlying efficient price process? Um, as I said before, this uh, no trade probability, I mean, it works, I mean, this is a quite um, clear concept in theory, but I was thinking, okay, now how could we estimate it? How could we empirically identify it? I, I was trying, I mean, you showed this nice table in your talk where you show where, well, I mean, you pointed out this case where this P is equal to 0.5, and then basically, was it the kurtosis or one of these uh, power measures basically doubled? Um, but how? What? But is 0.5 realistic? And this is empirically hard to identify. And then of course, why is it hard to identify? Because it's not clear. How should we think about the underlying price process? So, what is the true uh, process of trading opportunities if there would be no frictions whatsoever. Of course, we immediately think about a continuous time process because it makes uh, our analysis uh, more mathematically more tractable. Um, but if we come from the market microstructure world, uh, this is not so clear. So um, this, this brings me directly to this next slide here. So continuous time econometrics versus discrete time trading. I mean, your title of your, uh, of your paper is Discon Dis Discontinuous Trading and Continuous Time Econometrics. Uh, very, very important uh, aspect, but the link is not obvious because I mean, a central mechanism in many market microstructure models is that there are temporal feedback effects. Uh, you also stress that, so it's a part of your motivation. Uh, that means a kind of error corrections over time. And, and this immediately implies that uh, noise becomes endogenous. 
So innovations to transaction prices and quotes interact with the efficient price to some learning mechanisms. We get some temporal feedbacks. And these mechanisms, they naturally live in discrete time while in our world, we think in terms of continuous time. So of course now we could say, okay, we could work out the limit of the model. I mean, here's a delay, obviously. So here's a delayed response. But I mean, we'll, of course, mathematically we can do it, but what would it mean now in, real, in, in the real world? Because there's always a natural delay, um, how prices can adjust to information. And this makes these models who naturally live in, in discrete time. And I think this is a tricky thing. Now, if you want to uh, relate our models, our classical estimators to the world of market microstructure. So there is a paper by Torben and I also one of the co-authors where we uh, discussed this a bit. We tried to bridge this and we also came across these points and actually this is pretty, pretty tricky. So um, a few comments, then I'm done only on the trade durations. Um, of course, the no trade probability assumed to be constant during a day. Um, of course, it makes life easier, but I mean, there's a substantial literature on the stochastic properties of trade durations. I mean, they're very over time. They are quite persistent, actually. There's this the ACD model literature on by Engel and Russell. Uh, you also could just take that one here, one minus the P. Um, if this is modeled in continuous time, then this is basically the trade intensity, um, which in the literature is captured, for instance, by Hawke's processes. So this is substantial literature showing that these things uh, vary over time. So maybe one should stress this a bit more. Um, the other thing is now, what about the correlation between jump arrivals and trade arrivals? Um, also here, um, particularly when we see jumps, then we also see more trading and typically a price jump is associated with trading. Um, so I, I fully see that, of course, now incorporating this into the uh, into theory, the asymptotics would make it very hard, but it's a, of course a bit of a simplification, uh, which at least should be maybe discussed a bit more. Um, if, a few words now on, on the uh, asymptotics. Of course, this is an, an obvious point to make here. The independence of the Bernoulli trade variables for the same reasons is relatively restrictive. So the question is whether you could allow for some dependence. Uh, and maybe making this assumption three in your paper maybe uh, a bit more general. And and. What I would find very interesting, I mean, you stress that you do allow for a correlation between the efficient uh, price volatility and the tr trade durations. Uh, you allow this, but it would be, for me, for me, it was not so straightforward now to see where exactly this correlation now goes into the asymptotics. So how this correlation now influences the asymptotic variance. Uh, if this uh, correlation now becomes particularly high or low, that would be quite interesting to see. Okay. Um, yes, the, the market microstructure noise, you didn't discuss it uh, in, in your talk. So maybe I also should not say too much about uh, this. I mean, you made some, uh, you proposed some estimators based on pre averaging which can handle a certain type of clustering with noise. I, I was not so sure now from at least the, uh, the recent version of the paper, whether uh, how this is connected to existing work. But um, yeah, let, let, let me skip that. I mean, you did not use it in the empirical application anyway. So basically everything you do here is under the assumption that there's no noise. That's also the reason why you use uh, sparse sampling. Okay, uh, just on the empirics, uh, very briefly, I mean, this is very impressive. I mean, uh, impressive cross-section of uh, 4,809 stocks. Um, and of course, here I fully understand that you do not necessarily have mid-quotes and that you cannot go beyond one minute sampling or five minute sampling. I mean, and I think this is exactly the setting uh, what you have in mind in your theory. And I know I repeat myself, but that should be maybe stressed upfront. Uh, so it fits very well to the underlying theoretical setting. Of course, one minute trade prices, if I understand correctly, this is the underlying price grid you have. Of, of course, they also suffer from trade intermittency. I mean, you also have these effects already built in. 
Um, I was wondering, I mean, whenever we use five minute sampling, then at least uh, you could use some subsampling. So the question is now, how would subsampling change your results? Um, because I thought, and I just jump to the last point. I mean, you show that these pricing of realized tunis and kurtosis uh, might be only because of an improper handling of trade in action. Um, so, I mean, this is a very interesting result, but maybe it's also because of sparse sampling. With subsampling, I mean, you could uh, have a, a bit more efficiency in your estimates. So it would be interesting uh, whether results would change. Yeah, um, I'm, I, I'm done now with the con coming to the conclusions. Um, I think it's a very nice, very interesting paper. As I said, it, it really made me thinking a lot about uh, these underlying processes. I'm not convinced that it is so much about discontinuous trading. It's more about how to handle zero returns, how to deal with that, and what is the effective sample size and the effective standardization we should use in our power variation measures. And ultimately, it's about how to bridge the gap between continuous time models and discrete time market microstructure. That that's what I like a lot. Uh, that's really a very interesting but very tricky issue. And you make some important contribution here. And I I find the paper particularly useful when we think about a setting as in the empirical application. But if you think beyond that, I mean, then maybe you should connect a bit better to the existing literature. So, but very cool paper con relations to that, and I really enjoyed reading it. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas, for discussion. A lot of points. I'm sure Federico would like to respond, but in the fortunately we're running out of time, so if uh, we probably will have to do that in an informal um, discussion after we stop the recording. Before we do that, uh, there is a short announcement. Um, uh, so from next year on, we are not going to have our monthly usual webinars, um, but we're going to try something new. We're going to have our first SOPI thematic conference and. Um, Topic we've chosen, the first topic we've chosen is climate risk. And we already have a great lineup. Uh, Frank Diebold and Lars Hansen agreed to be our presenters. So the exact date is um, being set up. So it's going to be end of March, beginning of April. So look out for the announcement. But that's going to be um, something new that we're going to try in the next year. So let me just take one second to. Uh, to conclude the webinar series for this year, uh, to on behalf of all the organizers, to wish you Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and we hope to see you uh, to see you all next year at our conference. With that, let's stop the recording, and we can move all the discussion to the informal, unrecorded part. <laughs>